Welcome to the Courage Over Cowardice podcast, where I cover topics and issues that'll help you take a stand for Christ in culture. More than ever, followers of Jesus need courage to stand up, speak up, and to live out their faith because people need to know that there's a God in heaven that loves them, and it is his truth that sets people free. Thanks for listening today, and I hope that you enjoyed the episode. Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, for jo- Thanks for joining us for the Courage Over Cowardice podcast. It's my privilege on this particular episode to have Sarah Tarnowski, who serves as the Love Life Central Pennsylvania City, uh, City Director, working with churches in Lancaster and York counties to unite and mobilize them for prayer for the unborn, uh, to reach out at local abortion clinics, and to equip them to help mothers with unplanned pregnancy through Love's Life Uh, Love Life's House of Refuge Network, which we just uh, are working on and getting ready to launch. We have people going through training uh, for all of that. Sarah grew up in in New York City and has lived in Lancaster County for three years, which is virtually the same, New York City and Lancaster County, right? (laughs) Uh, She started uh, doing mission work at a young age and is passionate about equipping the body of Christ to speak truth into darkness and engaging the younger generation in kingdom-minded endeavors. Sarah and Josh have been married for one year and are soon expecting their first child this June, which is really, really exciting. So Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. So tell us a little bit uh, just about yourself. I gave you the quick the quick rundown, a little bit of an intro um, you know, going back to that, but I want to talk about love life and what you do. But first, I'd like just to uh, just tell us a little bit about your life that brought you to the ministry that you are now in. Yeah, for sure. So I, I grew up in New York City um, with a single mom. I was raised by a single mother uh, who had myself and my older brother, and she was post-abortive and uh, from many years prior before she knew the Lord and. So starting in high school, she kind of began to tell me uh, that part of her past and stories of her testimony are still um, still being revealed to me to this day. I feel like every month I kind of learn something new about her story. But uh, starting when I was like 16, yeah. she began to share uh, some of that part of her past with me. And and so as a young teenager, I, I really gave my life to the Lord and started following God I when I was about 15 years old, 15 to 16. And um and so at that age, I knew when she shared it with me, the pain that it had caused her, the amount of regret that she carried throughout her life. But I really had no, uh, you could say, heart connection to the topic. I didn't know where abortions were happening. I didn't know how they were being performed. I didn't know how common they were. I just had pretty much zero education on the issue. And I grew up in an awesome church, um, if you know, Times Square Church, right in New York City, right there in Manhattan, was mm-hmm. so blessed to grow up in that ministry and to grow up under solid teaching and under the word of God. But I just, like so many of us in the church today, had no mind to heart connection of what was happening with abortion in our country. Um, But it started when I was 16. And then fast forward to 2019, um, New York City passed a nine month abortion bill, um, essentially legalizing abortion for any reason up until the day of birth. And it was in January of 2019 that I began to realize as I'd grown in my walk with the Lord um, since I was about 15 years old, I think I was 22 um, coming around 2019. And I just began uh, to realize the amount of evil that had entered into our city. Um, Not only was this bill passed, but the One World Trade Center was lit up pink in celebration of this bill being passed. And so it wasn't Mm. just a toleration anymore. You know, we had gone to the level of celebration. Um, celebrating this this evil yeah. sin in our city. And that opened my eyes to what was happening. Uh, my, my friend and I began to see online and on social media that there was an event happening in Albany, New York um, in February of that year. So just about a month later, And we decided to go up to this event and it was called the day of mourning and a lady put it on and invited tons of pastors. There was probably several thousand people there, maybe one to 2000 people just across denominational lines. I remember even growing up in New York, my friend and I that day sat next to like probably Mennonite or Amish people. And I had no connection of course, to that culture, but it was just so cool to see the different backgrounds and church backgrounds people were coming from to collectively come together and acknowledge we need to repent for what we've allowed to happen 
in our nation, but specifically yeah. in New York. These were mostly uh, people from New York State there. And it was three hours of just prayer and repentance um, on behalf of the unborn. And the Lord just broke my heart that day. Um, you know, in the years leading up to it, um, I had gotten involved in a lot of evangelism. My mom had taken us on missions work growing up. Um, we lived overseas for about four four years of my life. Um, doing different missions work, but I knew that this was this was like a whole nother Goliath that the church was facing. We had gone out and done street preaching and tracks and evangelism and things like that. But when I became uh, came to face head on the abortion issue and abortion clinics in our city, it was like a whole nother Goliath that I had never encountered before. And that's what I began to see that day in 2019 yeah. at that event. Um, they had at one point all the New York pastors come on stage and just repent for never having preached on the topic. They had incredible testimonies of babies mm. that had been saved and moms that had chosen life and um, a, families that had adopted people who were involved in the political realm of this of this battle. And then at one time uh, during those three hours, this man named Justin Reeder uh, came out to speak. And Justin Reeder had started a ministry called Love Life about three years prior, but it wasn't even love life that day that caught my attention. It was the fact that he said last night, my friend and I went to the largest Planned Parenthood in New York and we walked around and prayed. And he kind of just shared that experience. And then there with him on stage was a mom um, named Izzy. She's now on staff mm. with us as a ministry. She works on staff, but she was a mom who came um, about the year before that. So I think it was in 2018, she came for an abortion at the busiest abortion clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina where our ministry is based out of. And uh, she chose life that day because she encountered a counselor in the hope of the gospel. And so her and her baby were there on stage. And I was just blown away by the fact that because a Christian was there, her baby was alive and that she was now walking with the Lord. And so when he said yesterday, we went out to pray at this uh, Planned Parenthood in Manhattan, he gave the address of it, the street that it was on. And I looked it up immediately on my phone. And I just turned to my friend and I said, every Friday evening, when we get off work, we're going to go there and pray like this guy did. And so we started doing that the following Friday, started to go there to pray. And um, I think maybe the background I had in missions and just in evangelism kind of spurred me to do that and just to get involved. But um, we just began to go and pray on our own. And uh, several months later, we ended up meeting Justin. And uh, from there, we kind of organically got involved with this ministry uh, starting in New York City and in Manhattan. Wow, that's uh, that's quite uh, a story, and I think it's really powerful. You know, you had talked about, just going back for a moment, um, going from toleration to celebration. And, uh, you know, currently, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many different things that be people are being awakened to within culture. You know, we've come out strong against, uh, well, lots of things, but, you know, lately it's been the drag queen story hour thing and awakening people and... Uh, people realizing like, hey, like, how did this happen? Like, all of a sudden, you know, you have a dude mm -hmm. thinks he's a girl dressed as a clown that wants an audience with kids. And like, how does that happen? What well, happens because we've tolerated it. And something that we've tolerated much longer mm -hmm. that's that's I mean, it's from the bowels of hell. The same the same thing is this issue of uh, Molech worship of sacrificing our children on the altar mm -hmm. of convenience and pretending that this is somehow a choice and all these different things. And, um, you know, it's something that in one sense, I feel like I've always been strong with it, with our church, but I just, uh, but I look and say, okay, what, what can I do more? How can, how can I be better uh, within that? Because now we're at this place culturally where, uh, it is a celebration. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, our current president and his vice president and that party's platform, which I do not support because it's pervasive and filled with evil, mm -hmm. and that's not an arguable uh, point for those that are listening. Like, well, you know, the other platform, that's fine, but you're talking about economics versus, like, sacrificing children. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you think about uh, these things that are openly celebrated. Right now, our president is saying, you know, if you reelect me, well, I'm going to make sure to over, you know, we're going to bring back Roe v. Wade and we're going to make sure that you can kill your child right up to nine months. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I appreciate that. That's a great experience and important for us. We all have a platform to lead in these ways and to be aware that, hey, we're now at a point of celebration. And so we need to come back and say, hey, we can't tolerate mm -hmm. um these things, and I know that you're 
you're a big part of that. So I guess um, from mm-hmm. that, you have you have a ministry, you uh, are part of uh, Love Life, which is a great organization that we've just in li- these last couple of years become familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about what you do as part of Love Life and... Uh, and and as you talk uh, talk about that, uh, I guess the secondary question is, you know, what is the crisis that we're facing spiritually and culturally? Kind of mm-hmm. identify the problem, and then w- what you're doing is, uh, with Love Life that's helping being uh, part of the solution to or part of the answer. Yeah, definitely. So Love Life's goal, this might sound funny initially, but I'll explain why we say this. We aim to primarily be a ministry to the local church. And The reason for that is because, like you just uh, elaborated on, we've gone in culture from toleration to celebration, and the church with abortion has now gone to toleration, and in some churches, celebration as well. And so now much of the church has tolerated what is going on in culture, and we're slowly but surely following in lines of culture, which we, of course, are not supposed to do. We should be setting the culture. We should be speaking light into the culture. But we have so often now just become uniform with the culture. And so our ministry, our goal is really to unite and mobilize the local church. Our mission statement is to unite and mobilize the church to create a culture of love and life that will result in an end to abortion and the orphan crisis. So what leads us forward are the great commandment and the great commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to love our neighbor as ourself. And we believe our neighbor is born and unborn. And so if we truly believe that's a human being, an image bearer of God in the womb, how are we called to respond as the people of God? And so back in uh, 2016, we started in Charlotte, North Carolina, and our founder, Justin, the Lord had just given him this vision really based off the story of Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah chapters one through three, we see that he heard the tragic truth of the broken walls of Jerusalem. And his response was, he went into a time of prayer and fasting and he called God's people to come and rebuild the wall side by side. And so what we do with churches is something called our 40 week journey of hope. Um, It's 40 consecutive weeks of prayer walks throughout the year. Um, We believe everyone can pray. Everyone in the church not only can pray, but should be praying. We have a mandate to pray. We have a mandate to intercede for, for people and for our nation. And so we ask churches to partner with us for even just one week out of the year say, pastor, can you give us one week to really engage your congregation in a more intimate way with your local abortion mission field, which is how we view these abortion clinics. They are mission fields where broken and hurting people are showing up on a daily basis. And we know when it's happening and we know where it's happening. So we can be there as the people of God to intercede. And so we ask them, join us for one week out of your your, uh, church's calendar this year. Pick which week works, works best for you. And we're going to educate your congregation. We're going to make them aware of what's happening, not just nationally, but in their backyard. So many Christians need to realize this is not just a D.C. issue. This is not just a Supreme Court issue. This is affecting your neighbors and most likely people in the pews next to you, most likely either themselves or someone in their family. And so we ask them, give us one Sunday service where you preach on life as the shepherd of your people. And we come in and we also just educate We uh, share testimonies, just explain God's heart for this issue, how people can engage. And then that week, your church is going to join us in prayer and fasting. And that Saturday, your church is going to come out and lead a prayer walk at your local abortion clinic. And that's where a lot of people get a little concerned, right? Because you're asking them to come outside the four walls. You're asking them to be a little bit confrontational. But our prayer walks are peaceful. They are just times of prayer and worship. If someone is there for the prayer walk, we ask Don't try to engage with people because that can just lead to some confusion and conflict. We have trained counselors who are there to talk with moms who are going in or talk with fathers, with workers. So if you're there for the prayer walk, just come and pray. We have a schedule for you to follow. Uh, Myself, as the local city director, I'm there to help lead the prayer walk, help guide you through it. Your pastors will be there to lead the charge. And that's what is so powerful is to see pastors who have never touched this topic to not only start preaching on it, but, but to bring their people out to where it's happening to pray and stand in the gap. And that's just such a beautiful part of this ministry. It's equipping the church to be the church. That's really what we want to do is come alongside the local church and say, Hey, we want to help equip yeah. you to be what God's called you to be. And then beyond your church's prayer walk, we have different ways that your congregants can get more involved. So if someone there wants to join our sidewalk outreach team, we will train them to do that. If someone wants to mentor a mom who has chosen life or is in a crisis pregnancy, we have a training for our mentors to go through and walk with these moms. If someone wants to join our prayer team or join our prayer walks monthly, we have a connection for that. So 
We want to give everyone a place on the wall, so to speak, to help rebuild these walls in our cities. And we truly believe if we do this and if the church engages in a biblical and consistent way, we'll see our abortion clinics shut down. Because ultimately, yes, we want to see yeah. laws change. But what we've seen throughout not just the, the decades, but the centuries is that oftentimes laws have not been enforced. There has to be a change of heart. There has to be a yeah. change of how we view the unborn and how we view abortion. And um, then I, we believe that will that will trickle down into culture and society where we won't even need abortion clinics because there won't be business for them. So that's just a, a yeah. snapshot of, of what we do with our local churches. And then our House of Refuge Network, as you mentioned, um, Freedom Life has become a part of that. Uh, Just briefly on that, we have several hundred of them across the country now, and these are churches that are committing to helping women and families in crisis pregnancies, and they're communicating regularly regularly to their church, this is where we stand on this topic, and this is how we can help you. We can't refer you for an abortion, and here's why, according to the Word of God. Your baby is an image bearer of God, and even if this is the result of sin— or you are sinned against, your pregnancy is not a sin. And we're here to help you walk through this and remove whatever's in your way of having this child. And so then the church has a, a trained representative in place to walk with that mom, to help connect her to resources, to connect her to our ministry. And we really want to, there was a recent study done that says it shows that one in four women seeking an abortion were attending a church at least once a month at the time of their yeah. first abortion. And so we want our churches to be places these women are running to Instead of running away from, they're finding refuge and help and hope in our churches. Yeah, that uh, that's really powerful and really good. I want to speak to, yeah. you know, as you talk about it from the church perspective, um, sometimes people will say, uh, ministers, um, soft woke, woke or uninformed uh, pastors, and it sounds good. So when you hear this, say, you know what, we need to make abortion unthinkable. And so we need to we need to figure out mm-hmm. like you know the financial and and you know all of these women are in trouble and so we need to make it and um, and I agree in this in the sense that we need to have that part um, but what is equally important is mm-hmm. uh, not I would say I don't have statistics and in, in, uh, in front of me at the moment but. Uh, most of the abortions aren't because of the extreme cases that the media would share. You know, they had nowhere to live. They're cast aside in the street. Mm-hmm. It's more convenient and it's promoted in culture. And so mm-hmm. ultimately that sin issue um, and the fear of the Lord has to be communicated. I, I was sharing this. Um, we had an event on Sunday night and I said, you know, if we don't speak the truth, in culture, and we don't teach it in our churches, where else will it happen? Where else will the uh, the love of God, the standards of God, like, right. it's it's not like you're going to turn on, you know, your favorite program, and they're going to promote, uh, like, God's truth and a Christian worldview that ultimately leads to flourishing. And so these are tough topics, and we can, we need to deal with them in a tender and a tough way, uh, but I think lessening, um, you know, for you know any ministers mm-hmm. that might be listening, uh, but for everyone, like lessening the standard uh, of God, uh, you know, as you're counseling with someone, your lead may not be, you know, you're murdering your baby. There's lots of ways to say things, um, but mm-hmm. also let people know, like that child mm-hmm. is special. Your economic situation or where you are right now mm-hmm. does not determine the value of that life. And stop giving the culture a pass uh, because of that. These are sin issues. And so we can do both. We can address this. And then we need to do that because too many churches are like, well, we just want to be a part of the solution. We don't want to identify the problem. And it's like, well, you're not going to have the proper solution if you don't identify the problem. And people don't even care about your solution if they don't know there is a problem. Um, right. and so I just wanted to share that, uh, and, and I know that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, your ministry and you guys feel that way, like we're doing these other parts and we want to help rescue, mm-hmm. uh, these women in these situations that want, that want help. Um, but everyone, uh, you know, within here, it's not just pointing people to help, it's also standing for truth so that people know, um, you know, our conscience, are, they're seared as a nation. We, have, we live in a nation, and our young people are being taught that if you want to uh, sacrifice your child on the altar of convenience, as I uh, kind of term it, uh, right up until, you know, nine months of pregnancy, then go ahead and do that. 
that's not an issue of I have an economic problem. Mm -hmm. That's seared conscience, and I have no fear of the Lord. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we need to bring that back, not in a condemnatory way. God loves every. I, I get all that, but in a, in a, in a clear way. And, and I appreciate mm -hmm. you guys, uh, you guys offer that you do that. You speak so clearly with tenderness, but also toughness, but with clarity, I guess, uh, I guess I should mm -hmm. say. Um, so, uh, right. you can feel free to comment, uh, on that. Um, yeah. and then, uh, also, uh, when mm -hmm. I, I just want to talk about what it's like to, because you said, so two things kind of setting you up, sorry. Um, you can comment on any of that, but. Uh, you had said, you know, hey, you know, we go out, we go on these prayer walks, and then you said there's also uh, counselors, and I just want to say, you know, we've been out there, we went out last year um, on one of those prayer walks with you, I think we have another date uh, this year, I'd encourage everyone to participate, be a part, we'll give you uh, information or, you know, some details at the end of the podcast and how to do that, um, but uh, what does that, uh, what does that, uh, what does that look like, because we hear in the news, that, man, all these people were just arrested and they're going to jail because they were just mm -hmm. out there trying to, you know, stand against mm -hmm. abortion. And I, I want to help, but I don't want to go to jail. So maybe you could kind of separate a little fact mm -hmm. from fiction there and then talk about other, you know, the sidewalk counselor. What is that? Because there might be somebody listening and says, you know, I think I would be interested in that, but I don't, I don't necessarily know what that is. So I set you up for like five different things. You can start, start wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, that, that's good. Yeah, I guess just to comment on what you what you previously said, um, it it is a very very important to address the root cause of abortion to be able to effectively reach people and reach our culture. There's many people, like you said, whether it's woke pastors or various even like uh, artists and cultural influences, influencers online, etc who will label it many different things like a socioeconomic issue. If we just poured more money into these communities, we would see abortion go down. We would see numbers go down. If we just voted this way, we would see numbers. And some people even say, vote for the Democrats yeah. and we'll see abortion go down. And they have, you know, all this different logic to try yeah. to explain that, which makes absolutely no sense. But people have all these different methods without addressing the root cause, which is, like you said, it is a sin issue. It is selfishness at its core. I'm, I'm just currently reading a book called The Story of Abortion in America. Um, highly recommend it to anyone. It's a bit over 500 pages, but it goes from 1652 to the present mm. day and just shows at a cultural level, at a street level, so to speak, how abortion became more tolerated, more accepted, first within culture, then within the laws, then you know within government, etc. And from the beginning, from the beginning, it was always a sin issue. It was man placing himself as God. And it was often men taking advantage yes. of women. It was men taking advantage of their servants and then forcing them into these situations. It was it was adultery. It was rape. It was fornication that was leading to all these abortions. And back, of course, in the 16th, 1700s, it was a lot less tolerated politically sure. and by culture. And so it was much more hidden. It was much more discreet, un unlike what we see today. But progressively, as we came more and more away from God and his word and his ways, we've just seen it increase more and more and more. And as culture began to make exceptions for it, oh, in this situation, it's OK. In this situation, it's OK. The numbers yeah. just skyrocketed just skyrocketed from the few hundreds to the tens of thousands in states like New York and California. And that's what we're still seeing today. So we have to go for, for the root. We have to go yeah. for the head of the snake, so to speak. And that's what Love Life is trying to do by discipling these families, by preaching to these abortion workers. We're trying to go for the head of the snake, which is, which is man yeah. placing himself as God, man placing himself on the throne and saying, I can do what I want to do with life. I I determine when this person lives and when this person dies based on whether or not it's a good time for me in life. That's really what it comes down to. And what you said is correct. In majority of abortions, the, the root reason, the main cause or main driving force is inconvenience. It is an inconvenient time for me in life. Yes, there might be some, you know, economic hardship involved or there might be some familial, you know, issues going on. But that's why we exist. And that's why, oh my gosh, thousands of pregnancy resource centers and crisis pregnancy centers and other ministries exist to be the answer to those problems and to say, 
we're going to step in so you don't have to make that choice. And then you're kind of left without an excuse. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's so many people who want to help you and walk alongside you, um, I'm not saying it's easy. We've met women that, man, carrying their baby to term and whether going the adoption or keeping their child was such a courageous decision, especially with the messaging that the world is giving them and that places like Planned Parenthood are giving them. So we're not trying to say it's easy. But if we don't give them the message of truth, we are leading them down a a path that is a million times worse, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually, because we know, man, you're opening yourself up to so much when you go through with an abortion decision, just spiritually speaking, so much depression, so much turmoil, et cetera. So yeah, just a little note on that. And then- Can you hold just a second? As far as your other question uh, is concerned with- Yeah, hold hold on just a second on the sidewalk and we'll get there in just a moment because I want want you to speak to this for a moment. Mm -hmm. So recently we've seen um, uh, people like Carrie Lake and Donald Trump and I I appreciate uh, President Trump uh, and his policies that he has brought forth, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. I view, um, mm-hmm. he has governed, though he's, uh, he's more liberal um, socially, but he's, he's governed um, more conservatively than anyone since Ronald uh, Reagan. And, you know, I would suggest even more conservative than Reagan in different mm-hmm. issues. So I really appreciate that. But he said something recently um, that was politically calculated, uh, that now will become popularized, uh, about the great exceptions. These are the exceptions that mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan, um, uh, said we need to have these in law and, and each of those things. And, and I think for those who worship politics and, you know, uh, a person above, um, you know, uh, scripture and all those things, it's easy to give people a pass. Like mm-hmm. we got to understand we're trying to get elected. We're trying to, right all these things, but uh, I don't view it that way. And I think we need to call it out. I mean, even Bill Maher called it out. And we were talking just briefly before we jumped on the podcast where Bill Maher just said, hey, I can respect the view of of pro-life people. They don't hate women. They just believe that it's actually murder. Mm -hmm. And then he made the comment. He said, he said, and actually it sort of is. And then he said, but I'm okay with that because there's 8 billion people on the planet. I appreciate it as candor, mm-hmm. at least say the quiet part out loud. Right. Um, but I just love to get your take on the exceptions because that's often an argument that's given. And then we can go back to the sidewalk uh, counseling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the hardest conversations to navigate with pro uh, pro choice or pro abortion people. But uh, the main exceptions that are usually brought up are life of the mother, rape and incest. And even many states uh, now that have very strict abortion bans in place following the overturning of Roe still have some of these exceptions in place. The hard thing with these exceptions is they're often not held to to begin with. So there's often many loopholes. For example, when you talk about life of the mother, this can be mental, this can be physical. Um, If you in many states, if you get just a letter from your psychologist saying you're a little bit depressed, or you have some depression in your pregnancy, you can be considered, okay, life of the mother, she can get an abortion in this state, even though we have strict laws against it. And so really any um, pro-life OBGYN who sees the life of the unborn for who they are as image bearers of God, and their goal is to protect both lives of the mother and the baby, and even former abortionists. One is uh, Anthony Leventino. He performed over 1,200 late-term abortions. He's now a solid Christian and goes around speaking in universities Mm. and conferences. He's absolutely incredible. I got to meet him a few years ago. And they will all tell you, you don't need an abortion today to save the life of the mother. If your goal is to truly preserve both lives, yeah. we can monitor the mother's health. We can That baby can be carried enough to term to perform a C-section if she can deliver naturally. And the life of that baby and the mother can be preserved. Or in the very least, it, you can do your best to preserve the life of both. Intention really matters here. It is very different for a mom to carry that child as long as she can, and everything is done to preserve that baby's life, than to immediately just go and have that baby's life intentionally taken and ended. And unfortunately, because abortion is even looked as like birth control now, many OBGYNs and doctors will immediately, we've encountered women at Planned Parenthood who literally said things like, I had a miscarriage before, 
I might miscarry again. So I was recommended to go get an abortion or I have, you know, this, this problem that might manifest later in my pregnancy. And so they told me to come get an abortion. So it's, it's viewed as such a light thing by so many doctors that the life of that baby is so quickly sacrificed. And so we know, and pro abortion, again, people don't like to, uh, accept this, but it's true medically today. And this is something that's incredible that we have the technology to be able to preserve both lives. And that's, that's incredible. It didn't used to be like that. Right now, when it gets to topics like rape and incest, first of all, it's so interesting how with the pro-abortion conversation, so much focus is put on that unborn child and not on the man who committed this atrocity. If anyone should be facing capital punishment, it should be the man who did Mm -hmm. this against a woman. What you're doing in an abortion is what's happening to the woman. It is an infringement on her rights, on her autonomy, um, on her actual autonomy. She is, you know, being forced into something she does not accept. You're doing the same thing to your unborn child. And we don't stand, you know, we don't stand here as a ministry and say, we know the ins and outs and all that. We know exactly how it feels. I personally don't. I do my best to empathize and I do my best to have compassion on women in that situation. But at the same time, if we truly care about her future, and care about that child, we have to tell her the truth and say, that's a, that's a, a life that you're now carrying. And we're going to walk alongside you hand in hand. We're going to give you the counseling you need. We're going to give you the support you need. We're going to give you the discipleship you need to help you preserve this life and parent this child if you choose to, or even connect you with an adoptive family if you choose to go that route. And so that's our job as believers to speak the truth in, in, uh, in yeah. boldness, to speak it faithfully. And um, to walk with her um, throughout that entire situation. And I will also say, you know, about 1% of abortions are from rape or incest, about 1%. And so if someone who is on the pro-choice side brings that up, I always say, okay, could we agree to first ban the other 99% and, and only leave those like proven situations? And majority of the time, I don't think I've encountered anyone who said, oh yeah, 99% yeah. should be banned. Majority of the time they say, no, 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 no. We need, yeah. we need all of them, <laughs> but we just want to focus on this, yeah, this yeah. 1%. And there are also just numerous testimonies yeah. of women who have chosen life out of that situation. They say it was the best thing that came out of such a horrible yeah. situation was now having my child and raising that child. They're the light of my life and the joy of my life. Absolutely. And so we know the value of a baby isn't determined by by the uh, situation of conception. If you look on an ultrasound, they both look the same. Yes. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I know as a ministry, we would address it and personally. Yeah, very good. Adding more trauma doesn't resolve and help previous trauma. Mm-hmm. And uh, encouraging people uh, in those situations, though they're awful and terrible, God can bring something beautiful out of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I appreciate you speaking to that. I wanted to uh, move on to, uh, you said that you are a sidewall counselor um, and that you have other people that are a part of that with you. What is that? Uh, What does that look like? And maybe uh, what's a story where you've seen an effect? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah, so I've been sidewall counseling. It's like my sixth year now. um, And I'm so blessed to be under people and trained by people and just walking alongside people have been doing this for decades. And so they've encountered just numerous situations, everything in the books that you could think of, we've probably encountered at an abortion clinic. And as far as how we do it or what it is, we, in our uh, sidewalk counseling training for all of our our team members, we primarily define it as evangelism. Um, We really want to go there and bring primarily the hope of the gospel and secondarily the help of the local church. And so there's three things we always aim to communicate to these uh, parents, whether it's the mom or the dad or both, um, that your baby's created in the image of God, um, that your child is um, purposefully and intentionally, fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Your child is a gift and a reward from him um, and really humanize that baby before they go into a place that is going to completely dehumanize that child. So talking to them about the development of their baby at eight weeks or even prior to that at six weeks, five weeks, you can hear your baby's heart beating. At eight weeks, I saw my baby's heart beating. And even though I knew it in my head when I saw it, I was like, that is insane. (laughs) That is incredible. And at eight weeks, that same heart is beating at 30 weeks. You know, it's not a electrical current like the Democrat politicians like to say, the electrical current that is inside of you. No, that is your baby's heartbeat. And it's intentional by God that there's a sign of life from the very beginning. And I've even heard that at the moment of conception, there's a spark of light that happens 
when your baby is conceived, which is just in, in, incredible. Mm. And from that moment, there are separate DNA. Your baby's yeah. heart is beating. At eight weeks, your child has brain waves. At 12 weeks, you can see your baby moving around. There's arms and legs and fingers and toes and just humanizing that child. Because it's true when you're that early on in a pregnancy and you've been lied to over and over and over and over again, you need to be reminded of what the reality is. And you need to be reminded of the life you're carrying. This is your son or daughter. So humanizing that baby, sharing about the word of God, how God views your child and the free help and resources that we have for them. And so a conversation can really look very different depending on how much time we have. Does that mom stop and engage with us? Is she walking from her car into the door and we have maybe 15, 20 seconds to say something? Does the father come over and talk to us? And we've had moms choose life because the father's texted or called their, uh, oftentimes their girlfriend, most times their girlfriend who is inside and shared the resources yeah. with them or even just began to express their support. Hey, I don't really want you to do this. I'm going to help you. I'm going to stick with you. We're going to raise this child. Majority of cases, the woman will change her mind if the father clearly expresses support. And expressing support isn't being neutral. It's not saying, I'm here to support whatever choice you make. No, it's taking a stand and saying, I don't support your choice for abortion. I support your choice for life and I'm here to walk with you. Yeah. So we've had moms turn around that way. We've had moms turn around after we said, maybe 20 seconds worth of information to them. And they took our, we have counseling literature, all our team members use that Love Life produces that talks about the development of the baby, shares scripture and testimonies and things like that, has resources on the back, has our information number on it. And they've come out after being inside for maybe a few minutes and have chosen life and turned around. And then we've had the longer conversations where we've gotten to go more in depth with the mom about what her specific needs are. And we've been able to stay connected with her for a longer period, you know, year, two years, five years, et cetera. And so just to give, um, let me see two testimonies. Um, I'll share one from New York and one that was recent here uh, locally in Lancaster. I'll never forget back in 2019 when I first started sidewalk counseling, um, was starting kind of in the summertime. And it was just incredible. We were seeing moms choose life and turn around and keep their babies. And we were sharing the gospel with so many people. And there was one day this mom uh, drove up and she actually kind of ignored us and still went inside. But upon coming out about five minutes later, she stopped and talked to us, broke down crying. And she said, I was supposed to go to a clinic in Brooklyn today and I couldn't find parking. And so I came here instead. And she had a Christian background, like we know a lot of these women do. Her, her uh, mother was a Christian. Her mother had, had even been trying to encourage her not to go, go through with the abortion. And uh, she said, on my way here, I, was, I prayed. And I said, like, God, give me a sign if you don't want me to do this. And so she came back out of Planned Parenthood and she said, you guys are the sign God gave me. And Planned Parenthood wouldn't do the abortion for me today. They told me I have to come back tomorrow. And she just began to share more about her situation. We took her for coffee got to sit down with her and just offer the help and resources we have. Well, that mom, I still get pictures of her daughter to this day. She named her Genesis. She was about four months pregnant. She said, I, I, I know it's a girl. She said, I haven't found out for sure, but like, I really think it's a girl. And it was a girl. And, um, and she's probably about four years old now. And I still get pictures of her today. And the mom is doing so well. Wow. She has two other children. That's awesome. And just, yeah, just so cool to see like God intercepting our path with these people that often have a soft heart. Um, another uh, situation we had just about two weeks ago here locally, a mom came to um, the Planned Parenthood and I was actually calling out to her a few things on her way inside. She didn't really show many signs of listening. She kind of made eye contact for a few seconds um, which is always kind of a good sign. At least, you know, they're hearing what you're saying, but she still went in about two minutes later, maybe she came out and she said, I couldn't do it. She said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. This is my third child. I, I said, did you come here for an abortion? She said, yeah, she said, I couldn't do it. And then on her way out, driving out, she stopped and spoke longer with one of our other um, counselors there. Um, a pastor was actually on the sidewalk with us that morning he gave her a Bible, got to pray with her. We got to speak with her, share resources with her. And she said, I was feeling conviction on my way over here. And when she saw us and encountered us and just heard the message that we gave, it turned her in the other direction. And um, and so she's keeping her baby now. So not every interaction is like that. Wow. Uh, I don't want to paint the picture that all these women come out just loving what we're saying. Sure. Um, we've been spat on. We've been, our signs have been kicked. People have threatened us. I I thankfully have never been punched, but I was really thought I was going to be a handful of times. 
Um, and you can, you know, some Christians, I think, have the idea of like, well, if you just say it in this way, or if you just, you know, give them this message, they won't get so angry. It's like, you can come mm. with the most compassionate message in the most compassionate way. But if you're meeting someone who is angry, if you're meeting someone who is already in turmoil over, over what they're doing, there's already like a, a guilt that is inside of them that often comes out in manifests in the physical. And ultimately, this is a spiritual battle. And so I always say this is yeah. such an intense spiritual battle. It's going to manifest in the physical sometimes. And we have to be OK with that because we're not there yeah. for everyone to like us. Um, not everyone there yeah. is going to like us, um, but we're there to be faithful to the message that God's called us to give. And so even if there's anger and hostility at times, we keep sharing what we're sharing. And as a ministry, we've seen over 5,600 babies saved through sidewalk counseling and prayer walks. Wow. So. That's uh, that's absolutely amazing. And I just want to say well done. I so appreciate that ministry. And if you're listening here and you say, you know what, I would be interested in, I would be interested in being involved with that. Like I'm interested in the mm -hmm. sidewalk uh, counseling uh, or, uh, you know, we'll talk about the church part in just a moment. Um, how would someone begin that process? That's a, I think I'd like to experience that. I'd like to maybe commit to that, the sidewalk counseling and the greater involvement. Uh, what, what does someone have to do? Yeah, I would say first step. Well, if you're if you're local or even if you're anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, you're welcome to reach out uh, to myself, uh, which would be Sarah, S-A-R-A-H at lovelife.org. Um, you're welcome to reach out that way and get more information. I would just send you our application and next steps. If you're anywhere else um, in the nation or any other state, um, I would say reach out to info at lovelife.org, just I-N-F-O at lovelife.org. And our staff would just depending on your location, um, get you connected with the local uh, director and teams that are in your area to get you trained with them and out on the sidewalk, even if you just want to go and, and pray and, and see what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I brought this up uh, previous in the podcast, but I think I went ADD in the moment. And, um, you know, we see a lot of the, uh, the FACE Act and people being arrested and so forth. Um, and though you guys are placing yourself potentially in harm's way, you're also abiding by the laws that are on the books. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, if you're going there to be a sidewalk counselor, if you're going uh, with our church or another church group to go to be a part of, um, you know, uh, we're adhering to the laws that are there and doing our best to work within them. Would that's, that's, that be an accurate statement, Sarah? Uh, yeah, yes, I would say so. Yeah, our prayer walks... We definitely um, aim to honor our local law enforcement um, and have good relationships with them in all of our locations. Um, but yeah, we do aim to abide by those laws with our counseling and our prayer walks. Yeah. So two things. You, you guys, it's a powerful ministry, doing an amazing work, rescuing uh, babies, women, uh, one interaction at a time, uh, you know, ministering to churches, doing your best to awaken uh, the church. And, and each of those things. And I love that. It's so powerful. Um, but I, as we kind of bring this podcast together, could you, excuse me, could you um, uh, just, uh, number uh, one would be uh, women that are facing crisis pregnancies. Um, what do you feel like would be good? Because, you know, someone's listening to this and they're just going into work. Uh, they're just, you know, they're at school or whatever, but they're, they're potentially going to have an interaction with someone that finds mm -hmm. out that they're pregnant that may not be excited about it because of the circumstance mm -hmm. of their lives and they're hearing the cultural narrative. What, how would you encourage someone to approach that and, and speak into that? Yeah. Um, I would say primarily start with scripture. I think our ministry is so good with this. And I have to remind myself that, of this oftentimes of God's word never returns void. Mm. Start with encouraging scripture about that unborn life. Even the fact that our Savior Himself entered this world as a in, in a uterus, right, as a fetus, <laughs> our Savior chose to enter through the womb of a woman, and uh, encouraging her that God designed her and created her to carry life and to bear life, and that that life is not hers to take into her own hands. That that's a child that um, God has given her, despite the circumstances that might be surrounding it, despite maybe her situation or the situation with the father, which we often we often find the situation with the dad kind of contributes to the the uh, drive for her to get an abortion.
but encourage her that there's community. If you're part of a church, you bring your church around that mom. Try to, you of course can't force anyone to come with you, but encourage her to come with you into your community, to come with you into your church, yeah. to come with you around support. I would say, take her to your local pregnancy center, get her a free ultrasound where she can see what her baby looks like, where she can hear her baby's mm. heartbeat, have her sit down with maybe one of the counselors in that pregnancy center and have them talk with her and offer the resources that they have as well. Um, I think the churches and the pregnancy centers working alongside each other, that's part of our vision and mission as well is to really bridge that gap, bring those together. And I think if you if you communicate the truth of God's word, you communicate the humanity of your baby, you communicate the free help that is um, around her and available for her, um, that is probably the most, I would say, the most important messages that you can give um, anywhere along those lines. I mean, you can go you know, more in depth on any of those things. But if you communicate those three things and you show that you're uh, there for the long haul, you know, that you're not going to you know, try to get her to change her mind and then leave her and never talk to her again, but you're there to really walk with her and support her. Um, I think that means the world. A lot of these women just need the encouragement, just need the support, just need the reminder um, that God created yeah. them to do this. And, you know, the message yeah. they're given by places like Planned Parenthood is you can't be a mom because of X, Y, Z. It's not time, not the right time for you because of X, Y, Z. And so if we can counteract that with the truth of we will equip you to be the best mom you can be to this baby. And also they're often given the message of, I mean, I had a, a young lady once show up at Planned Parenthood who was like a friend of someone there or something. And she started screaming about how all the children who were going to be aborted were going to become um, a mass murderers if they lived, that they would all just become mass like murderers. They would all just be criminals. And we have this idea of like any baby that's saved is just going to become a criminal. And what's crazy is so many yeah. people that are influential. You think of like Tim Tebow, right? They were told to abort him. Mm -hmm. Think of like, there's several yeah. NFL basketball players. That the parents were told to abort them. And so just reminding them like your child can bring change to this world. Like speak positively yeah. over that baby. Your baby will be a good influence on this world and on this culture. And we won't let them end up in foster care as the church. Like we will take in your child and we will help raise them. Yeah. Um, I think is an important message. No, that's, that's so good. And so I just want to encourage uh, everyone. We can't do everything, but we can do something. And this is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Love Life is an excellent organization, whether it's through our church, uh, another church, or just reaching out to them directly. Uh, Sarah at lovelife.org. Uh, S-A-R-A-H. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Sarah at uh, lovelife.org, uh, or you can go to the website and questions directly to the organization, info at lovelife.org. And mm -hmm. for those who have had... Um, who have had abortions, uh, God is a God of grace, and He loves you, and uh, His forgiveness is available. He, he gives it to no matter what we've done. There's no sin that's too great that God can't forgive, heal, and restore. And I, I, would, I would say and suggest, and you can speak to this in kind of the final words, mm -hmm. um, that what a way to, uh, to move past the pain and use it for purpose. Mm -hmm. And maybe if this is your story, uh, lean in and say, you know what, I want to help others not experience the pain uh, that I've had. What would you say to those ladies as we close uh, yeah, we who have had an abortion? Yeah, uh, we need you in this ministry. We need you to be a voice. Um, we need to hear your stories and your testimonies. My mom was one of those. God called her into pro-life work in the 80s and the 90s. My mom was doing this way before me and before I was born. And uh, I guess the mantle has fallen onto me now. Um, but her story, her testimony has touched many people. God redeemed her life. And if you know Christ and you are a new creation in him, um, as Pastor Sam said, your, your past is washed clean. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And your testimony will reach so many other women. Your story will reach so many other women. Yeah. Um, it will also reach those who are in the world who might still need their minds to be changed, who don't know Christ, but will be affected by hearing your story. Um, I, I'll mention that we have um, the post-abortive or abortion recovery arm of Love Life is called Restored Life. Our wonderful Restored Life director, Stephanie, she helps women get connected with abortion recovery, but also write out their testimonies um, kind of in a, in a concise way where it can be shared at our prayer walks. So for any woman who's open mm. to have their testimony shared at prayer walks in, in 22 different cities, um, please reach out to Love Life. Uh, you can also email Stephanie at lovelife.org. 
She can connect with you, get your testimony written out. Um, we had just a, a quick story on that. A, a 74 year old woman share her abortion recovery testimony at our prayer walk last Saturday for the first time. Not until recently mm. had she even opened up about the two abortions in wow. her past. And she's in her 70s. And she said she never experienced more freedom until she started mm. sharing and speaking about it. And uh, her church becoming a house of refuge and getting involved with us was was kind of what opened her up to do that and encouraged her to do that. So it was it it's always so encouraging for people to hear um, what God has done in their life. And our emphasis is on the redemption mm -hmm. part of the story. Our emphasis is on what God has now done in your life following this. And that's what we want to leave people with. There is hope and there is healing. That's right. We're standing against the works of darkness, the lies of the enemy yeah. uh, that uh, wants to steal away the future. And Sarah, thanks so much for all that you're doing with uh, your ministry. Appreciate you, your husband, and uh, thanks for sharing on the podcast today. Uh, and for each of you, thanks for tuning in. And again, check out uh, lovelife.org, a wonderful ministry that you can be a part of. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I hope this message has inspired you to courageously stand up, speak up, and to live out your faith. If you like what you heard today, give me a five-star review, follow the Courage Over Cowardice podcast, and share it with others to learn how to stand for truth in the midst of culture.